Hello, today I have an electronics repair for the channel. This is a rather expensive and large piece of lab equipment used for biology. I got a quote to either buy a new one or repair this one, and wow, it's really expensive, so I decided to take on the challenge myself. In this video, I will go through analyzing what is wrong with the system, look at a quote for the repair of the system, and actually fixing the machine. I will also have a guest star going over the actual function of this machine since it's well beyond me what this thing actually does. It is going to be a multiplicitous one. As a first pass explanation, this machine is a thermal cycler, which is used in the process of multiplying DNA or RNA. The machine has to precisely control and cycle temperatures and uses a decently large amount of power to do so. More on this later on. The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. If you want to help support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon, Super Button, and my website down in the description. Special thanks to my patrons and channel supporters. So this machine is going to need some troubleshooting process to find the fault and figure out if there's an economically viable way to fix this machine. The first step in this process is going to be to plug it in, and this isn't always the first step, but in this case I want to figure out how it is misbehaving, so plugging it in is the first step. The machine powers up and appears to be okay. The screen comes on and the machine boots the ultra-modern operating system Windows CE. Anybody remember that OS? I have a sound level meter that also uses that still. As the machine begins to boot up and an actual cycle is started, the machine starts to make a clicking noise and although it appears to be mostly operating, it will fail and shut off eventually. While the machine is apparently running like this, the power supply is failing to start properly. So now I'm going to switch over to the power analyzer and take a look at the performance of this thing in the power input side. The unit has a rating plate stating that this thing can use 800 watts of power when it is processing samples. This is a fairly substantial power supply. First, the idle power consumption of this device. When you plug it in and the switch is off, it uses about 5 watts of power. This is pretty bad, so a lot of electronics stay powered up inside this machine even when it is doing nothing. The CPU isn't booted up, so this is just burning 5 watts doing nothing. I hope the more modern machines do better than this. Next, when the machine is powered on, the power consumption jumps up, but we can start to see some of the fault here. Once powered on, the voltage rails were all checked and everything looks okay, so the machine was in a steady state. When looking at the power consumption on the power analyzer though, the current is very high and the power factor is very low, and you can hear the machine ticking. The power factor correction is a technique to consume AC power as efficiently as possible. The higher the power factor, the lower the comparable current, and therefore the lower the loss in wires and transformers that supply your power. The goal is to have all the waves look the same shape as the yellow line, a sine wave. The machine definitely has power factor correction, but the graph from this machine on startup gives us a hint into what is going wrong inside. The power factor circuit is failing to stay powered on. You can see it starts and works for a small portion of the time, but then it doesn't stay on, fails, and then tries starting again. This hiccuping process is very common in power supplies. The power supply tries to start and then fails to stay on, so ends up consuming short pulses of current. Following the sine wave still, the, the power factor correction circuit doesn't stay on. Okay, I have a suspicion now. The next step in this process is going to be opening up the machine and wow is that a process. They didn't make this thing easily repairable, but the small volume devices like this don't get the benefit of iterative design like polished high volume products. The whole machine is opened up and the circuit board city is exposed. What does all this stuff do? Well, let's give it a once over and try to section this off into the various portions. The first thing that happens on the circuit board as the AC power enters is some protection circuits and some filtering. This filtering is not so much to prevent bad signals from getting in, but more likely to keep the noisy signals made inside the machine from getting out. That power wire is a big antenna. The filter components do work both ways though. There are a couple of components that do protect the inside. These are transient suppressors for any over voltage on the input side. This stage is also the first point of AC to DC conversion, which is a full bridge rectifier and a small capacitance. This connects to the next part of the power supply, which is the standby power supply. This supplies a low voltage to keep the components ready to turn on. In this case, this is always powered up, even if the machine is off, and this section gets quite hot. After this, there is a large inductor and some switching components that make up the power factor correction circuit, which then leads into the main storage reservoir of energy. This is the large bank of high voltage capacitors. The isolation transformer is fed by a few more switching transistors making a DC to DC power converter stage to get the final voltages the system needs to power the end electronics. Along the sides of the circuit board are two power supplies for each temperature controlled section of the reaction module. 
The CPU and glue logic fill the front section of the circuit board along with the connections to the front panel which stores the operating system and interfaces. The front panel has a compact flash card and a battery for storing the operating system and parameters like date and time. Well, that's what's in here. Upon exploring some of the design choices in this machine, when the top section is not installed, the fans do not spin at all, meaning the power supply is started up and no airflow is moving across the power supply. This means that components can easily overheat in this condition. So first, make sure that the machine is not left in an on state without an experiment section installed in the machine. Next, only a tiny portion of the air is allowed to make it to the power supply. These tiny holes in the top of the machine are the only way air gets from the fans to the power supply. There are components at over 100 degrees C in this section, in close proximity to some other components that don't like heat. This really should have its own fan if it is going to get that hot. Okay, so identifying the problem. It's capacitors. It's always capacitors. The small DC power supply that brings the standby power to the power factor correction circuit board is losing power as it tries to start up, and therefore it hiccups as it builds enough energy to try and start again and again. It looks like there is no fault protection of this failed power supply section, so the rest of the machine continues as if normal, drawing huge power in short bursts. So it doesn't have enough storage, capacitors store, to keep the power factor correction circuit powered. There are four small capacitors, all relatively low voltage, all around this standby power supply that should be replaced. As long as the machine hasn't been allowed to run for too long in this condition and nothing else is damaged, these are the main issue. Let's look at why this is the main issue. The old capacitors need to be removed and checked for performance. They cannot be checked in circuit. I'm going to use this inexpensive component tester which gives an indication of not only the capacitor's value but also what we really care about here, equivalent series resistance. The resistance determines how fast a capacitor can deliver its energy. As a capacitor ages, this value may increase and in this case with all the heat in this area, it is no wonder these capacitors have lost some of their capability. This one capacitor measured approximately 150 ohms of equivalent series resistance. There is no way this is going to work. The others all measured on the high side. Well, I went ahead and purchased some replacements. The original capacitors were Panasonic branded. I went ahead and purchased the same ones and measured the values of a few new and old before installing. The new ones all measured very low equivalent series resistance and met the tolerance of the capacitance easily. The old ones were borderline or bad on the equivalent series resistance and a little lower on the capacitance. These tiny parts only cost a couple dollars but render this whole machine into a brick instead of a complicated piece of lab gear. So the actual process of reinstalling capacitors is very straightforward. Remove the old ones. The most annoying part is getting the solder out of the holes in the board if they don't clear on their own. This is a multi-layer circuit board so who knows how many connections there are inside the board. So label all the capacitors, make sure you know which way they go. Remember, if you put your capacitor in backwards, once the holes are cleared, you can go ahead and install the new capacitors, solder the connections, clip the leads, and wash up with your choice of chemical. I'm using isopropyl alcohol here. Then it's the joyous part of putting this machine back together. So many screws, clips, and springy bits. Okay, we are finally reassembled here and ready to test again. Oh, yeah, final assembly. I give, give this a quick check before putting it all back together to make sure nothing popped. As always with a repair like this, if you don't know what you're doing or looking at, hire a professional. I'm a hack, not a professional. These things have dangerous voltages and currents inside, so remember, you're doing these repairs at your own risk. Okay, with the magic of video, it is all assembled and ready to go. No, I don't want to talk about it. Upon plugging it in, the idle power looks the same as before. This is good. It should not have changed. Okay, time to flip the switch, and look at that. It came to life. As expected this time, the power factor correction circuit booted up and the system appears to be operating normally. Time to get some experiments running and see if this thing can hold up and operate correctly. Ultimately, the test of time will determine if this machine is actually repaired or not, but for the short term at least, checking that it operates here on the bench is important. Now we can get some idea of how this thing is supposed to use power. It looks great. The waveforms are nice and clean. The power supply is operating exactly as expected. This has a very good power factor corrected power supply. The design is good, but I think it was all about time on this machine and the thermal design in the long run that took this power supply out. Heat is the enemy of capacitors. So I might know a few things about electronics, but I don't know anything about genetics. So to give a better explanation of what this thing does, I enlisted some help. AC has a doctorate in genetics and is going to explain the process this machine actually performs and a little bit of the history. Welcome to the biology edition of All Things One Place. Let's talk about PCR. First of all, what is it? And what do these machines do anyway? 
Now, I'm sure everyone's tried as hard as possible to forget that whole pandemic, but you may have heard about PCR from discussion around accuracy and cost of various tests for SARS-CoV-2, where molecular tests based on PCR were referred to as the gold standard for accuracy. The specific machines used for those tests were most often RTQ-PCR, or real-time quantitative PCR machines, which allow visualization of DNA amplification using fluorescent reporters. So after you get probed all the way through your nose into your brain like this poor guy, the folks back in the lab would use a test kit like this combined with your sample in a machine like this one, and in the end you'd get curves like this that you can use to make a call as to if your molecule of interest is present or not. In the case of this COVID-19 test kit here, this says RDRP, that would detect the viral gene for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. But that's getting ahead a bit, so let's review some molecular biology. This schematic shows how DNA replication occurs in cells. First, the helicase enzyme comes in and effectively unzips the double helix, which allows DNA polymerase access to an individual strand so that it, it can incorporate new nucleotides, which are the A's, T's, C's, and G's, to synthesize a new strand. Biologists wanted to use some of the same tools that cells use to synthesize DNA in the lab, particularly polymerase enzymes, because purely chemical synthesis of long DNA chains would be extremely slow. If you throw some DNA in a tube with three nucleotides, heat it to melt the strands apart instead of using helicase, cool it just a little, and then add DNA polymerase and wait a while, you'll get a new copy of that DNA. Hooray! What if you want to make a lot of new DNA copies? For example, let's say we're starting with one molecule. That's one copy. You melt it, go through your synthesis step, you end up with two molecules, two copies. If you want to make a lot of copies, you have to go through many such cycles, as many as 20, 30, 40 or more, depending on how much you want. You have to use that heat step to melt the strands apart every single cycle. However, it turns out that the polymerase enzyme that was used early on for this was derived from E. coli and wasn't heat stable. So when you melt it, you might know what happens from cooking eggs. You end up with a denatured, non-functional protein. The solution for this was actually to add enzyme manually for each cycle. So the earliest PCR machines were really just graduate students with water baths. And an example like this, you could have multiple water baths set to the temperatures that you need and you'd move your tubes between the different water baths. And then after each cycle, you would add more enzyme every cycle and potentially for 40 or more cycles. And of course, the timing of all of this is also important, which I'm sure sounds like a really great way to spend your afternoon. There were some early attempts using robotics to automate this, but these were pretty large, custom, expensive systems that really wouldn't have scaled to commercial sale. Then came the isolation of the thermal-stable DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus. This is an organism that lives near deep ocean heat vents and was highly adapted to warm environments. This made automation of PCR feasible without robotics, because the TAC polymerase, as this enzyme became known, survives the 95 degree melt step. There's no more need to constantly add more enzyme. Cetus and Perkin Elmer developed the first self-contained thermocycler machine for PCR based on resistive heat and a compressor-based cooling loop. So as you can imagine, these machines are pretty big. They hit the market in 1987 and were extremely popular as far as lab instruments go. They were popular enough that you can still get the early models on eBay. There's actually a bunch of them, and it looks like many of them still work. PCR machines are now a fundamental tool in biology labs, and pretty much any lab that does molecular biology is going to have at least one of these, and it's going to get used pretty frequently. Since the original machines from Perkin Elmer that used compressors for cooling Peltier devices were adopted in the 90s for heating and cooling, which allowed these machines to get a lot smaller. Since then, not a whole lot has fundamentally changed, except for, well, now we've got touch screens for user interfaces, and we can also stack on other things like the optics that you need to be able to do real-time qPCR, as I mentioned earlier in the example of COVID testing. Thanks for that. It is great to learn a little of the process this machine actually performs and why it exists. Okay, that was not a difficult repair in the end. The thermal cycler is back in the lab and has been operating experiments every day. This is the best possible outcome, but it doesn't always go this way. The lab had more than one of these machines, and one of the machines suffered more damage and it looks like it will warrant further exploration to figure out why the power supply isn't starting up. My guess is the larger capacitors have also started to fail or something else in the circuit has been damaged by the high current passing through. 
But the first machine is fully repaired and operating and has been going for many months in the lab now. It goes to show that a simple repair of a complex electronic device is possible. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to recap the whole machine, but then that $2,200 repair cost starts to make sense. And it could be much more than just capacitors that are wrong. In this case though, $10 to make one machine fully operable. I think that is a success. The more modern versions of this machine, which start at $8,000 for the base, no reaction modules, the part with the Peltier that does the heating and cooling, comes with a separated logic board and power supply, so this repair would be as simple as swapping the power supply in the future. Much easier and less expensive. If you like this repair video, check out the link in the description where I have another repair on the M Audio Studio Monitor Speakers. Yeah, it's capacitors again. Thanks for watching. I'm still working on that B Link mini computer video, specifically an older model, because they can be had inexpensively on sales. Turns out it's not so easy making computer videos. Check the All Things website linked in the description for upcoming videos, and as always, I'll see you in the comments section. Thanks again, and goodbye.